It's the 100th episode of America's Evil Genius, and what a great occasion it is. This is an absolute celebration. We got our confetti out. We got our party hats out here. We're ready to go. We got our little little things you blow at me. Oh, this is great. This is a celebration here, and thank you to all of you who have been a part of this for the last two and a half years who have allowed me to come into your home or your computer or wherever and teach you and we are going to have a party this is a celebration this is a great milestone for the america's evil genius show and let it not be said let it not be said that we here on the america's evil genius program are an intolerant bunch let it not be said that we on the america's evil genius program are not multicultural or that we're not sensitive to other cultures and so forth. Oh, we are tremendously sensitive to other cultures. Let me get this party hat back on here. We gotta, we gotta have a party hat. We're gonna party, right? No, we are very sensitive to other cultures here and celebrating with them and that's why to make this party, to make this celebration the best, best party we can have, we got us, we got us a pinata. Yep, we got us a pinata right here. Or as our friends south of the border would refer to it, El Pinata. That's Mexican for the pinata. So we have El Pinata over here, a little bull looking thing. And you know, I every time I see a bull or I hear the word bull, the, the first word that comes to mind is Obama. So I think we need to name our pinata uh, Obama. This is Obama the pinata over here, right? So uh, just like at any party or fiesta, you want to say that, uh, one of the funnest things you can do is you bust open the pinata and get the treats, right? That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we got our pinata. We got Obama the pinata here, and we're going to bust open Obama the pinata and get our treats. So we need something to bust open Obama with here. What do we... Oh, this will work. Yeah. This will work. This will put Obama out of his misery real quick, won't it? Yeah. This will take care of it. So we need to bust open Obama right here. Oh, what a party this is. I can't wait for this. All right, I'm going to... Bear with me. I'm going to move this mic just out of the way because uh, we need some room here to bust open Obama the pinata here. All right. Are you ready to take out Obama? <laughs> I know I am. All right. Are you ready? One, two, three. Come on. Come on, Obama. <laughs> I got you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> we got him. Looks like we got old Obama and put him out of his misery. Ah, there's one more for good measure. Right in the head, right? Oh, that was fun. But, ooh. Hey, you know what that means? We did bust open the pinata, right? That means we got treats. <laughs> treats. Let's see what kind of treats we got in the old, the old pinata. Ah, there's Obama's head. We don't need that. All right, let's see what we've got here. <laughs> what the hell is this? What the same hell is this? Frozen peas. Frozen peas. What does it say in the front here? Uh, Dear Travis, congratulations on your 100th episode. Have some yummy veggies with our compliments. Sincerely, Michelle Obama. Oh, this is bullshit! I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's Evil Genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And as we said earlier, thank you very much for your support over these last 100 episodes of America's Evil Genius. And we uh, hope to continue to have your support in the future as we go forward with this. Uh, we've had a lot of fun here so far, but uh, I did want to talk about a couple of things. And, and to be honest with you, on the, the occasion of episode number 100, uh, I got to be honest with you. I wrote and rewrote and re-rewrote this episode numerous times uh, over the last week or so in preparation for what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to revisit why we do in this show in the first place. I wanted to talk about what we've learned over the last two and a half years that we've done this show. I wanted to talk about what it means today. I wanted to talk about some of the, the government shutdown stuff. It all kind of fits together, but to be honest with you, if I would have covered all those things, we would have been here for 45 minutes or an hour. And uh, none of you want that. <laughs> I certainly don't want that. So Instead of, of writing out a full episode and, and uh, setting this up like we normally do, 
Uh, I just want to kind of shoot from the hip today and kind of just touch base with you uh, one-on-one on on the occasion of episode number 100. You know, I know uh, that we've got a very dedicated fan base that follows this show, and again, I thank you for it. But I also understand that over the last two and a half years, since April of 2011, a lot of you have kind of come into the fold as time has gone by. Maybe most, most of you weren't here from day one. Maybe you didn't see the first show. But as social media is, you know, people see something they like, they forward it on to their friends, and they forward it on to their friends, and so forth. And you've picked up this show somewhere along the way, and we thank you for it. But in doing that, you may not have seen some of our original things, and you may not know why we do what we do here. Uh, And that's something that I really talked about uh, a little bit on the first show we ever did. And I wanted to kind of bring that up to speed here to to reiterate that to those of you who are new to the show, uh, because it's pretty important, I think. You know, I, I'm, I'm like you guys. I've seen any number of conservative pundits and commentators and reporters and politicians and whatever else over the years. You know, your Rush Limbaugh's, your Glenn Beck's, your Ted Cruz's, uh, you know, different guys that, that do newspaper commentary and cable shows and radio and everything else. And I've always appreciated the contributions of those guys. And in the cases of, of some of them, like a Limbaugh or a Beck, I've really admired them. But... In acknowledging their contributions, there was always one thing that bothered me about all of them. And that was the fact that no matter what they did, no matter what a Rush Limbaugh said or a Glenn Beck said, or a conservative politician said, certainly, no matter what they said, no matter what they did, there was always kind of a ceiling that they would never go beyond. There was always a certain sense that there are certain boundaries they never could cross because it would cost them in the long run. You know, if, 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 you're, an, if you're an elected official and you go over the bounds, then okay, you can lose an election. If you're a radio host and you go over the bounds, well, you'll lose advertisers potentially or, or some uh, network executive or, or management guy might go skittish and pull your show or, or tell you to change your topic. And that's always been the one thing that's, I don't want to say bothered me about conservative talk radio or conservative politicians or authors or anything else, but it was the one weakness, I guess, that I thought they all had. And I used to complain about that for years. I, I always used to complain and, and say, as much as I love Rush Limbaugh, why doesn't he go all the way? Why doesn't he say the things that I'm actually thinking? He always would seem to stop short. And I'm not pointing him out in particular. All of them were like that. So a couple of years ago, I thought to myself, hey, why complain about it when you can just go do it yourself? And that's what I've done here. Everything you see around you here, as humble as it is, uh, is bought, paid for, produced, put together, written, edited, whatever, by me. There's literally nobody else involved in this show. And what that means is that I don't have to worry about losing advertisers. I don't have to worry about some executive telling me to tone down what I do. I don't have to worry about some producer saying maybe we shouldn't touch that topic. I don't have to worry about some network guy throwing me off the air. Nobody can throw me off the air. Nobody can stop me from saying what I want to say. So what that what the point of all this is is that really I'm the one guy you'll ever hear from that can actually tell you the truth without repercussions. I'm the one guy that can tell you how it is. And that's a role that I thought of has always needed to be filled in in American politics and American commentary. And I humbly have taken it upon myself to, to take that role. And I thank you for following along with me on that journey. Now, one of the themes that has come up a lot on this show, and one of the themes that the Limbaugh's and the Becks and everybody else really won't go all the way with, but I always have, is the theme of producers versus parasites. I have told you over and over again on this show that the real division in America is not between rich and poor. It is not between Republican and Democrat. It's not even really between conservative and liberal, although that starts to scratch the surface. Really, the main difference in America, the main separation in America is between producers, those who work for a living, contribute to society and make a life for themselves versus the parasites, those who don't wish to contribute, those who wish to take theirs from what others produce. And I've told you that's the main difference we have in society today. And I've told you that the Barack Obama candidacy of 2008 and later 2012 was centered around that very dichotomy. Well, last week we saw yet another in a long line of examples of this. When the government shutdown happened the very next day, Barack Obama had one of his press conferences out in the Rose Garden. And Obama did one of the uh, little tactics that is becoming routine for him. I I call it the human shield effect, 
where he's embroiled in a lot of controversy. He has to make a speech to answer for something. And so he brings out with him like 20 or 30 people to surround him who evidently have, quote unquote, benefited from whatever the hell it is that he's uh, advocating that week. And I think we've got a, a picture somewhere of what happened in the Rose Garden last week. There you see it. Uh, Obama surrounded by this human shield of people that have supposedly benefited from Obamacare. But I noticed something about that picture, and, and, and as I heard that press conference, there was something missing. There's a lot of things missing. Sure, Barack Obama told the story of some single mother who couldn't get health care and now she has it, or some person over here who had this sob story, or person over here who had that sob story. And it, it was like one of those old episodes of Queen for the Day. I mean, some of you younger folks have never heard of that show, but it's an old show in the 50s that they'd bring some down on her luck housewife on the stage and she'd tell her sob story and they'd give her a washer and dryer or some shit. Well, that's basically what this press conference was. It was it was a Sally Strobes commercial. It was, here's the poor people that I'm helping. Don't you feel so guilty for opposing me? But there's something that was missing in all of that. For all of the human shield that Obama brought out there and all the victims that he brought out there, I thought there are some victims who are curiously missing from that group. You didn't see any victims in that group who were people that had their hours cut at their job because of Obamacare, did you? You didn't see anybody in that group who had their, had their premiums on their health insurance go up because of the new requirements of Ob Obamacare, did you? No, he didn't have any of those people involved. He didn't have any victims in that group who were business owners who wanted to expand, but now they really couldn't because of the cost of Obamacare. Nope, none of them were out there. No, nope, uh-uh. Nope. Didn't have anybody in the healthcare industry and the health insurance industry out there as victims who are now having to have their businesses basically on the line because of this unfair competition. Oh, no, no, no. He didn't have any of those out there at all. The point is that Barack Obama was doing what liberals have done for a century now. They were trying to tell you who the victims were and who the victims were not. They were making a value judgment for you in terms of whose concerns in this society are valid and whose concerns in this society are unvalid. Now, I've heard a lot of Obama's uh, minions and Obama supporters over the years say, he's the president of the American people. you got to respect him. He's, he's the president of the American people, really. The way I look at it, by his own demonstrations... He's, a, he's the president of only a certain segment of the population. He's only the president of the parasites. He's only the president of those who consider themselves victims. The rest of us who work hard every day, who don't consider ourselves victims, who want to make a way for ourselves, he doesn't give a damn about us. He wants to take from you and I so that, that single mother over there can have health care or that, that single girl in college can have birth control or that some minority somewhere can get some affirmative action. That's what he's about. He decides, and his party for 50 or 100 years has decided who the victims are and who the victims are. Now, some of this might sound a little callous to some of you, but I want you to think of something. I understand, I don't agree with it, but I understand those folks in their 60s and 70s and 80s who maybe lived through, let's say, Jim Crow and segregation or some of the other things that happened in our past, I can understand some of those people thinking that the government needs to do a little bit more for some people to help bring them up. I don't agree with them, but I can at least understand the reasoning of where they're coming from. But what's lost in all of this, and what the Obamas of the world don't get, the Democrats of the world don't get, is this. For most of the American population today, most of us are not that age. We're younger than that age. I'm 39 myself. So those of you who are in your 30s, your 40s, your 20s, you've never lived through Jim Crow. You've never lived through the Great Depression. We have been fortunate enough to grow up in a society where, frankly, things like racism and segregation, frankly, were not in play. They, they didn't exist in our world. And, and God bless America for that. We didn't live through Jim Crow. We didn't live through a time where you couldn't go to a certain school because of your skin color. You couldn't live in certain places because of your skin color. None of that happened. For our generation, anyway, we grew up in a world where everybody could be admitted to whatever school or business or housing or anything else they wanted. The gates were flung wide open for the people of my generation and younger. 
So you got to understand, for people like us, when you're saying certain people need a handout from the government to get by, it doesn't make sense to us because we've grown up and we've been around people all our lives who went to the same schools that we did, went to the same businesses that we did, did the same things that we did, grew up where we did, and they were diverse in terms of color and ethnicity and religion and gender and all the rest. And frankly, they were able to do everything we could do. Some better than others. But there's nothing that we could do that we were privileged in that they weren't. There, there was no such thing as a so-called white privilege for my generation. It didn't exist. No matter how bad, bad off you started in my generation, you could make it. Many of them have. So when we hear people in today's Democratic Party talking about how, let's say, minorities need some extra help, we look around the minorities we've known over the years and we say, no, that's not true. We work alongside minorities every day that do a great job and make every dime that we make, maybe more. We look at Democrats and liberals talking about a glass ceiling and we say, where the hell is a glass ceiling at? We see executives and managers and CEOs that are female and what glass ceiling? We see people talk about impoverished people needing every kind of handout, and yet we all know sometimes in our own families people who came from very impoverished circumstances and made it on their own. What I'm getting at is this. For 100 years, America, and I'm talking about both parties here, America has bought into the idea that big government can solve the ills of the world. That big government can solve poverty, it can solve discrimination, it can solve sexism and racism and all the other isms you can think of. And we as a nation have given that the old college try. Yes, the Democrats are always out in front of it, but the Republicans weren't far behind him in a lot of cases. But as we look back in 2013, what are the results? Well, the fight between the races... The consternation between the races is as bad as it's ever been, in spite of minorities having, in some cases, unfair advantages. We see people still complaining about gender discrimination when it really doesn't exist, when there is no glass ceiling. We're seeing the poverty and the impoverished, some of them, who for years we have been over backwards to give them every kind of government program and handout and welfare and school lunch and anything else you could think of, and they're still complaining with their hand out and they want more. It demonstrates one thing. When you kowtow to the lowest common denominator, thinking that you'll help them up, you will have the opposite effect. You will instead enable them to stay in the morass that they're in. Really, that's the point of this whole show. That's been the point of this last two and a half years. And God willing, it will be the point of the next two and a half years or five years or ten years or however the hell long we do this thing. Am I giving up hope on those who are victims right now and saying that they'll never come around? No, I'm not saying that. There are some individual people in those in, in those classes who don't know any better. They've been, they've been educated the wrong way by the left and by the schools and by the media and the entertainment industry. There's hope for some of them. And for those people, I think it's in, imperative upon us, the conservatives, us, the producers, us, the patriots, to engage them and teach them. That's part of what I try to do here every week. But at the same time, there's some of them, many of them, maybe even the majority of them, who are so entrenched in this destructive mentality that there's no hope, that they cannot or will not come around. And to those people, and this may be something you disagree with, but to those people... We must stop trying to kowtow to them. We must stop trying to be nice. And we must be blunt with them. You know, there's two types of people in this world. There's one type of person who learns by having a pat on the back and having things demonstrated and having a carrot on the stick. Well, we as a society are pretty good at teaching those people. But there's a second group of people out there, a second group that really can't learn anything until they get kicked in the ass. We in this nation have seemed to have forgot how to do that. Well, a lot of the people that are backing the Barack Obamas of the world, backing the Democrat parties of the world, and are wanting to steal from the producers so they can lay on their couch all day, smoke their crack, and watch your Maury Povich. A lot of those people will never learn until they're kicked in the ass. And that's what I'm here to do. There are others out there in conservative commentary who will be nice and teach you point by point, and that's fine. That's their gig. That'll work on those 
who are open to being taught. But for the rest of you, I'm your worst freaking nightmare. And I'm going to browbeat you and beat you over the head until you get the damn message. And the rest of us are too. We're sick of footing the bill for you. And what we need to do for those that won't be engaged, for those who think they have a say on what we producers produce and what we do, for those, we must obstruct them at all costs. We must do whatever we can to prevent them from being a part of the political process. Yes, I said it. Because our nation has caused far more harm when people like that vote, when people like that involve themselves in the political process, and we must do what we can to keep them out of it. You want some proof? Look at any big city you want to name that's been under Democratic leadership for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Detroit's a great example. St. Louis, another great example. There's many more. Cities with a lot of poverty, where a Republican or conservative hasn't been elected in ages and don't even run. And what's the result? You've got dangerous, broken down, dilapidated cities, crime ridden, that are dangerous as hell. That's the end result of liberalism. That's how it ends every single time. And if we allow the parasites to continue to have a part in this electoral process, and this whole nation's going to end up like Detroit. I don't think any of us want that. So that's the mission going forward on this show. Again, thank you to all of you who have been a part of this. And I have people come up to me all the time that don't really say anything on Facebook or Twitter, but they come up to me personally and they kind of look around and make sure no one's watching them and they say, keep up the good work. I like what you do. There's a silent majority out there, as Richard Nixon once said, a silent majority who are moral, upstanding people, and that's who we are. It's about time that silent majority became a lot less silent embodied in the Tea Party, embodied in the Ted Cruz's of the world, the Rand Pauls, and on a smaller level, yes, the Travis Cooks of the world. We are here to save America. Some of you don't realize you need to be saved, but we will save you anyway, because we love this country. That's it for this week. That's it for this hundred episodes. We start in the next hundred next time. This is Travis Cook, America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.